All right, greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Arons van Sale. And tonight we're not going to be shining a light specifically on the southern tip of Africa, but rather we're going to go a bit north, uh, maybe even a bit west, if you want to use that type of angle. So we're going to be talking about a myriad uh, of issues, and uh, maybe to give you a little bit of an idea uh, before uh, I introduce my guest here tonight, not that uh, many of my subscribers won't recognize him, uh, on tonight's menu of what we're going to be discussing is firstly uh, my guest's recent uh, opinion piece that he co-authored, The New Great Game. We're going to be getting into that. We're also going to be discussing, uh, discussing some uh, nuanced factors regarding Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the phenomenon of modern research, uh, resource wars, the mirage of net zero, nuclear energy, and the useful idiots in the West. And to discuss all of those things here tonight, joining me is Ihu Kriar. You will recognize him. He's been uh, on the channel, I think, about twice now, if not more. He is a South African structural engineer who did his master's degree in the field of nuclear energy. He's a writer. Uh, like I said, uh, he released this excellent piece just recently, and he's also a podcast host. And all the links to that in the description if you want to go check that out after the show. So welcome on the show, Ihu. Welcome back. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Arist. Mm. So let's start off. Uh, like I said, I want the foundation of tonight's uh, discussion to definitely be your, your latest piece that you co-authored. Mm. Uh, you titled it the, the New Great Game. Now, uh, maybe some of my listeners have already read it. Maybe they know what you're referring to when you talk about The Great Game. Um, but maybe just let, let's start off with that foundation of uh, what is what was the great game? And then why did you choose to uh, write this new piece on what you call the new great game? So the great game was a geopolitical game, if you can say that. So the diplomatic game that was played between Tsarist Russia and Great Britain between um, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So really leading up until the First World War, more or less. And they fought mainly about um, over countries in uh, Middle Asia, Southeast Asia sometimes, um, but generally, you know, Afghanistan, Middle Eastern countries, it had implications for Persia. And the idea was that one gets the upper hand in diplomacy and resources, um, you know, over the other. At the same time, also European powers expanded into commodity rich Africa. It was also the countries of the world went through the industrial revolutions. They wanted to get into resources. So they wanted strategic resources like coal, like grain. Um, you know, minerals of this sorts, and then use that as diplomatic leverage over others. And that's the idea of the great game. You make certain alliances strategically. In those days, you conquered countries, um, probably still do that today, but um, basically to get resources. And the resources allows you to dominate certain aspects of the economy over others. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and then when uh, with that con or that historical context out of the way, uh, your piece is called the New Great Game, and uh, I think that your your description already gives a little hint uh, on where you're going with this. So maybe uh, just set the table on uh, on this New Great Game that you're seeing unfold a little bit uh, to the west of uh, the the places that you just mentioned. So yeah, the it's obviously got relevance to the war in Ukraine, but to make it simple, um, human civilization depends on energy. Um, everything we do depends on energy, whether it's a fridge, whether it's a coffee that you make, everything's got a kilowatt hour, right? So energy, energy is, the is the currency of the industrial revolution, is the currency of the modern civilization. Whoever controls energy, okay, all the materials needed to generate energy, those countries will be more powerful than others, right? So I wrote this article of Joel Kotkin, who is an American geographer. Um, he's a very big um, historian in the United States, and he wrote a book recently called Neo-Feudalism, A Warning to the Middle Class. And anyway, so the argument him and I put through is that for years now, um, China and Russia, the autocratic countries of the world, Iran to some extent, have been trying to outmaneuver the Western alliances. While the West was preaching internationalism, a rule-based international order, they were seeing resources more in terms of the Westphalian principle. Westphalian principle, the principle of the nation state. And every nation does what is in its interest. So we make strategic alliances for the interest of our own country, as opposed to saying we have an international law that everyone plays along with, except obviously the United Nations, United States who gets to violate it. Um, so they were not playing along with this. So for example, when um, the wars on terror broke out, the United States invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, who were Sunni countries. Russia quickly moved in with strategic alliances with Iran and the um, Houthis, Houthis in, in Yemen, for example, who are Shiites. 
Um, so they were trying to use the fault lines of civilization as a means to get control over strategic oil. Uh, the United States was getting the Sunni oil and they were getting the Shiite oil, or at least they had alliances with the Shiite oil. China is laying a pipeline to Iran, for example. They're laying a pipeline through Mongolia. Uh, China has this big belt and uh, um, what do you call belt? Uh, it's the belt and the string of pearls. Belt and road. Yeah, the belt and road. Yeah. And that is a means to bring development to certain countries, but they're doing it with geography in mind. So the mm. trade routes will go through Asia. China is the 2049. Um, plan to be at the, the center of human civilization they openly state it it's not a you know conspiracy although that word means nothing but they openly <laughs> state in their documents 2049 china must become uh, it's the 100th anniversary of mao Zedong. we will become the center of human civilization um russia's playing a different game russia has got a game of they had this once great soviet union or russian empire but Russia has gas, for example, and they have managed to convince the Europeans to take their Russian gas. Now, when there's a war breaking out in the Ukraine, there's less um, diplomatic leverage over Russia. Even America has to now make alliances with Venezuela and with Iran. Mm -hmm. And we've seen all these, there's a list of the speakable all countries. Enemies. <laughs> all the arch enemies are now arch friends because they have oil. Yeah. Okay, So the great game is essentially to try and use diplomacy and alliances to sort of win at the supply chain rule. It also yeah. has to do with the strategic sea routes. American Navy controls the, the oceans, therefore they control the world. China is trying to build a string of pearls to challenge that. And they wanna build even a harbor at Walfus Bay next to Namibia to try and oh, get yeah. the Cape of Good Hope. You know, Lenin said the hope, the Cape of Good Hope was a strategic location before the Zis Canal, for example, played in. So all over the world, we're seeing what we are arguing, we're going back to the age of the Westphalian principle, but it's sort of a multipolar world. Um, and the central prim the central driver of it will be energy, but it's also other strategic commodities. So, for example, rare earth minerals. There's lots of them in China. They have a monopoly over it. So if you build all these wonderful wind and solar farms, you need to buy Chinese stuff to do you're so. You're a big fan of those uh, those wind and solar farms. Yes. Okay. Then you're a very big fan of them. Then, you buy, then you're basically using child labor in the Congo. But, you know, we don't talk about that, for example. Um, but uh, it gets weirder than that. For example... Um, China internally is using its own coal reserves. So it is it is much aware of the great game. China does not want to import Australian coal anymore. It'd rather get it from South Africa or from Indo Mongolia. Okay, so it's developing its own coal for its own industrialization and it's taking a Westphalian principle. Well, Russia is the same one. Russia's processes preparing for sanctions was end to end process. So they're not uh, damp so they can dampen the economy when the shock of sanctions come in, for example. So they were all playing this beforehand, and we argued the Western world was asleep. Um, they did not realize this because in the West it was free markets for everyone. And it's okay if the prices are cheaper because we make stuff in China. doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter if all the technology goes to China, right? Because we as consumers get it cheaper and therefore it's a win-win situation. It's just economics, Milton Friedman. And the Chinese were saying, well, this is wonderful. You're re-industrializing your own economies uh, you know, while we send you credit and debt to fight your stupid wars. So you know, this is the great game that's being played. And we're making the argument the autocrats are playing it and the West needs to wake up. Hmm. Uh, just to clarify again to the listeners, uh, if you just joined us, uh, when Hichu is talking about we, he's talking about him and his co-author in their piece, uh, The New Great Game. There's a link to that in the description if you're going to go read the whole thing, but we will be getting into large parts of it. Now, Hichu, you've mentioned a lot of a uh, lot of factors here, but uh, something I wanted to, to zero in on, uh, seeing as you're this massive fan of uh, wind and solar, um, how does green energy, maybe elaborate a little bit on that, how does green energy factor into this massive game that you're describing here how why is this wow, such a this linchpin is... well um look one way to subvert democracies is to try and convince people to believe stuff you know it's, it's edward bernays's argument that the masses must be controlled through simple ideas while the clever people make all the decisions now you can apply this to another country so for example if you are the chinese or the russians and you see that there's a Swedish girl who loves wind and solar energy, you would give money to their campaigns. And we know that renewable and anti-fracking people were funded in Western countries to, you know, to block fracking. Basically, in the UK, for example, it was is the case. And also, um, English bankers are in bed with the Chinese. Now, the Chinese have been pumping money into renewable lobbies. And what does this mean? Well, if you have renewable energy, wind and solar, you know, it's it's not a surprising fact that the sun doesn't always shine, especially in the UK, and the wind doesn't always blow. Okay, and what do you do when that's happening? Especially if you, you live in Pretoria. 
Spaceship Eleven Pretoria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, what do you do when there is no wind and no sun? Um, the argument is a battery. Well, all the batteries in the world can run the electricity grid for a few seconds. It's not going to work. You need fossil fuels, and the cheapest one is a gas turbine. Now you can see how Mr. Putin knew this. He said, "Wait a minute. These guys are all want wind and solar." I'm going to give it to them. We're going to encourage them to have it. And then I get to sell them gas when, you know, they, so they become dependent on me. At the same time, the Chinese are loving it because they're making the solar panel uh, with Uyghur um, cheap labor, and you can call it that. And uh, ironically, they made from coal because how do you make a solar panel? You take quartzite and mix it with coal and you have a solar panel. So it's made in China using carbon dioxide. And then we send it to the rest of the world. So they become dependent on our. Uh, um, uh, supply chain, obviously you need rare earth minerals for that, they've got a monopoly on that so they love the great reset, or they love the um, net zero thing and it's just stunning, nobody has, has mentioned the obvious fact that China's 2049 policy of being the center of human, of human civilization coincides with 2050 so the West is going to deindustrialize with renewable energies as China just becomes king. And nobody has figured out that the Chinese have been pumping money into these useful idiot movements. Mm. Right. So we so we can convince our policymakers to go green everywhere. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, I completely follow where you're going with this, but uh, do you do you understand how how asleep and how many useful idiots there had to has to be in the West to not see this coming? How can someone like you? A South African see this, but the leaders in the Western world were just well, South, South Africa is a very corrupt e economy, <laughs> right? So we, we we know instinctively when somebody's using a story to BS you. Um, <laughs> and, and this is basically what's happened, that people have yeah. bought into these stories. And uh, look, the, the environmental movement predates Putin and it predates um, mm. uh, the, uh, Xi Jinping and all these guys. Um, it started as uh, probably a semi-honorable movement against nuclear weapons, um, whatever your view on that is. And then it, it took a life of its own and it wanted to see green everywhere. And there is, to the extreme side of the environmental movement, there's a, um, a belief that man is the center of all sins on earth and, man, and it's industrial man which caused all the problems of the world. Although none of these people want to go back to, to pre-industrial civilization because there were no mm. toilets and running water and fridges and uh, life expectancy was much lower. But whatever it is, they, they, they hate industrial civilization. So you can see how a movement that calls for the deindustrialization of the West serves the geopolitical interest of the Chinese and the Russians. And that's the argument we make, um, that uh, this movement has caught on. It's a type of a new religion to some people in Europe. It's everywhere. I mean, this is worse than the woke movement. I mean, every your financial companies that are now doing ESG, sustainable capitalism, right? People want to seriously invest pension funds mm -hmm. into these green schemes. Mm -hmm. um, they want to charge people more taxes. We're talking about carbon taxes. And we live, unfortunately, in the Western world with an elite that is totally detached from reality. So I'll give you an example. In France, a few years ago, we had the Gilets Jaune riots, and that came out um, as a being after Emmanuel Macron increased the um, the price on diesel. Just a small carbon tax. Nobody in Paris knew why these attacks, why these riots occurred, because none of them are using cars. They use the trains, right? But most French people use cars to go to work. So a price on diesel, a price on petrol increase would affect their lives. And basically, you sit with this is what Joel has argued in his original book, Modern Feudalism. The people who make the laws, these green laws, they don't pay the price and everyone else has to pay for it. And yeah. I think when the right ideologue comes along that is going to blame the green policies for the increase of standards of living, uh, we're going to be in deep trouble. Trump was almost almost had his uh, finger on the button. He couldn't figure it out entirely. But you'd remember Donald Trump said we need clean coal. Well, you know, okay, he said, you know, pump the oil. He knew what he was talking about. We, uh, he had some instinct to it, but he, he didn't put this right finger on an knob yet. These so-called green policies, the Great Reset, the Davos, it, it, the IMF is doing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of people um, are expensive. They are costing the average person an enormous amount. Smart growth is another part of this. And I think it's time that a lot of people just stand up to it and say, look, these things have major implications for our own cost of living. It is irresponsible for deindustrializing the Western world. It is responsible for moving jobs to China, empowering autocratic regimes, giving Putin gas. And we're not going to take it anymore. There's nothing wrong with burning coal. There's nothing wrong with burning um, natural gas. You know, we can 
build nuclear power. That's also got its own issues if you want to. Mm. But the idea that you can run modern civilization on wind and solar panels alone is a complete fantasy. And I think people need to, to wake up to it. Hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned in your piece that uh, the West is basic. Every missile that uh, Russia launches into Ukraine is funded by the West, uh, as you yeah. explain now. Not not just that. Also by Saudi. Also that Saudi Arabia is funding on Yemen. Hmm. Um, you know, these are two wars. You can uh, Yemen is it's genocide technically that the Saudis are committing there, and it's uh, we paying for Saudi oil money, uh, while we don't want to exploit our own reserves. Hmm. And if we exploit our own reserves, the Saudi would have much less weapons. So yeah. we send them weapons, um, whether it's Putin as well in Ukraine. It's horrible what's happening in Kharkiv and Mariupol and those areas. Hmm. So, um, yeah, hmm. I mean, the fact that we became dependent on them. And th this is the hypocrisy of the Green Movement, because had we done these things in our own countries, untapped our own resources, uh, go to the Westphalian principle of energy as everyone else has done, um, we would have done it cleaner because the Saudis don't care about environmental standards as much. The Russians don't care that much about it, and neither do the Chinese. So they're even doing damage to the environment, and then we are sending money to autocratic regimes to bomb innocent civilians. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, to add to that, uh, actually, you mentioned something there earlier on that uh, the new green movement uh, has taken on the form of a, a quasi religion or a modern religion. And that's actually yeah. what you and me, uh, what we talked about uh, on the previous episode when you joined me. It's called the, the green religion. And uh, yes. you can actually find that on my channel if you just search conscious character. Yes, your, your original sin is being a carbon is carbon footprint. The cult of sustainability is there. We're trying to return to Eden, which is the Eden of sustainable life. Mm. And net zero is the prophecy that has to come. You know, this industrialization even is the fall. Yeah, you know, the fall of man. You know, the evil yeah. fruit of industrialization and carbon emissions. Yeah. You know, so all of, they've got all these structural forms mm. of a religion. And if you go into the detail of CO2, um, even the IPCC, which I'm skeptical of their report, but whatever, do not predict the end of humanity if we increase our CO2. And actually, I think the world has reached peak coal, um, well, we're very close to it anyway. So we have, uh, yeah, we're probably going to reach peak gas quite comfortably if we just allow development to happen. So the best answer to this is do nothing. Somebody in the comments mentioned Malthusianism. That's correct. Mel Thomas Malthus's ideas was responsible for the Irish potato famines. Malthus actually opposed his ideas being implemented, but nobody listened to him. Another guy is uh, Yasenkoism. I mean, now that we in Ukraine, uh, um, Trofan Yasenko's ideas was implemented in um, Ukraine to try and ration food, and it led to the famines of Stalin and all the more, and there's still a lot of blood, but bad blood because mm -hmm. of that. So yeah, um, bad ideas have consequences, and I think net zero is a very similar idea to all of these. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned there what uh, the Saudis are doing in Yemen, and uh, you mentioned earlier that the United States are now buying is now buying oil from countries like Venezuela, and that's exactly what uh, what Samuel Huntington was talking about when he talks about the the hypocrisy that comes with Western universalism. When you uh, when you believe that uh, your values are universal, you almost always are forced to be a hypocrite uh, when it come when the tire hits the road i mean now you're to, we're talking about a situation where you're not getting gas from russia anymore because they're invading ukraine so now you're going to get uh well, you're not getting oil from them anymore so you're going to get oil from venezuela a regime that drives over protesters with armored well, well i mean in europe the choice is do we buy russian gas or saudi oil so which we so we're going to bomb basically <laughs> you know that, that's the models at the moment of it so you know there's no morality in all of this um I mean, my brother was showing me stats the other day. I'm not sure how authentic it is, but something like only 20% of the world's population live in what you can call a functional democracy. Most people mm. don't live in democracy and they don't care about it. I think that is a thing that the West hasn't come to terms with yet. Now, I'm all for saying the West is great and um, you know it's a better model of living. I like France. I like um, the parts of South Africa that's Western. I like um, the United States. But we need to be realistic about this stuff and say, well, this is our interests. These are our allies. Okay, fine. I'm all for saying, theoretically, we can export, export the good of the world, you know, through movies and stuff of this sort, and we can trade with the rest of the world. And they're welcome to study and exchange ideas. And we're not scared of Russian propaganda, we're not scared of Chinese propaganda, for example, because our ideas are better. You know, Kennedy said that we mm. need to not defeat communism, we need to outcompete it. You know, something of that sort. Mm. And I think I, I'm all for saying that, but I'm also saying let's be realistic in how do we deal with the world. So uh, we can use our diplomatic leverage strategically. There's nothing that stops us from putting pressure on Saudi Arabia to say we're not going to send you any more weapons to bomb the Yemenis. 
there's no more reason to sanction the Iranians because Iran is a less despicable regime than Saudi Arabia, for example. Doesn't mean I approve of Ayatollah Khamenei, but he's just measurably less or worse than the King Abdullah who buys the independent newspaper in the UK and puts his name all over the place. So, you know, um, that's the type of thing we need to look at. And, and we need to say, okay, we will trade with the rest of the world. We need to stop dictating to them how to live. I don't think the West is in a position to do that anymore. The unipolar world mm -hmm. is coming to an end. And also internally in the United States in particular, there's a lot of issues, right? A lot of issues with veterans coming home, a lot of opioid addicts, all those issues can be solved, but they're not solved if we're going to bomb another country. So we need to mm -hmm. stop regime change, basically. That's that's the argument I make, I put forward. And yeah, the argument we put forward in the great game is we need to realize that the West is one country, one model among many ones, basically. Yeah. And um, you need to look, you need to stop stop looking at abstract principle. Let's look at the world realistic and say, this is how we survive, mm. as opposed to try and expand, and then we kill ourselves in the process. Mm. So uh, for episode 100 uh, of my podcast, I actually read uh, uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, nice. The West and the Rest as a kind of a little bit of a, a insight to some people. An essay from 1997 that a lot of people don't, doesn't, don't exist. Oh, they so because um, he, he's the first guy with the insult devils, man. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that when I read, yeah, I've read that essay probably in the past 10 years. I've read it probably, yeah, I think. I would say eight or ten times. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what I what I find interesting, well, maybe not ten years, maybe last five years. But anyway, in the past, uh, in the past, when I read essays or insights like that, um, I would never have been able to imagine that they they age like a fine wine as we uh, as we move forward. Now there is a paragraph there that I want to quote before I get into one of the your own claims in your in your piece that i think is actually matches this and i want you to elaborate on it but let me lay the groundwork mm -hmm. first here so um huntington writes in that essay of his in the post-cold war world the most important distinctions among people are not ideological political or economic they are cultural people and nations are attempting to answer the most basic question humans can face who are we and they are answering that question in the traditional way by reference to things that mean most to them. People define themselves in terms of ancestry, religion, language, history, values, customs, and institutions. They identify with cultural groups, tribes, ethnic groups, religious communities, nations, and at the broadest level, civilizations. People use politics not just to advance their interests, but also to define their identity. We uh, we know who we are only when we know who we are not, and often only when we know whom we are against. And now a quote from your own piece that uh, I actually want you to uh, elaborate a bit on, because I think it dovetails very well with this quote. And uh, you said there, mm -hmm. once the conflict ends, the conflict with Ukraine and Russia, or devolves into a guerrilla war, national identity, geopolitics, and economics, not abstract principle, will drive events. Uh, can you uh, add a little bit of meat on that skeleton? Yeah, I, I, it's it's. I think actually, Joel, my, my co-author, wrote that, but yeah. I sent him the piece of Huntington before, and that you sent, so he was, and he's he's well aware of it. So, um, what we had in mind there is is very simple. That um, it's called the Westphalian principle of government. Westphalian being the nation state. Um, I I still believe in the principle of a nation state, broadly defined. I mean, I'm not a jingoist of any sorts. But broadly defined, national identity is going to drive the course of events. And it's going to, if climate change is real and stuff, um, it's going to drive energy solutions. You cannot expect of um, Saudi Arabia to give up oil. <laughs> it's impossible, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to do it. So, you know, if we decarbonize and, and, and don't grow, it's not going to happen. So the argument we, we make out of that for energy and and, and you know, to get rid of abstract principle. Let's not chase down dream worlds. Let's not try and export Western democracy to the rest of the world. And then we don't even get it right, like in Ukraine, which was a horror show in 2014. Um, let's rather say we look at what is in our own self-interest. It's a realist argument for international relations. See the world for what it is. We need energy. Okay, who do we make a deal with? The Saudis? Fine. Putin? Fine. But realize who you're making a deal with, right? And realize that you need to have a counter to him. If you can try and do it within the democratic nations, that might cost you a little bit. I mean, it, it might just be more expensive and you might be better off in the long run. So you need to evaluate these risks realistically. Um, also, um, I'm a believer that nationalism is not something you can go, you can wish away. 
Um, and it, it's part of the thing. The nationalism, whether you think it's ugly or not, is a, is a rea reality. It's a reality in Ukraine. Russia versus Ukraine is nationalisms at each other's throat. It's not a liberal democracy. Give me a break. You know, there's no ways you can argue that either Zelensky or Putin is, you know, or LGBT activists. It's just not going to happen. Um, the same is uh, true when I was in Catalonia, for example. It clearly showed to me that there is an argument for realism in Spain. Now, whether the Catalans are part of Spain or not part of Spain, that's um, you know that's up for discussion. But unless you look at the world for what it is. And in, when it comes to energy and resources, you say, okay, we need to develop, we need to increase our industrial capacity, but let's do it for our own self-interest first, for our own political interests, trade, and not just the free trade fantasy that we were sold, um, you know, a few years ago. I mean, look, I'm a capitalist, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a heart of capitalist. I believe in free trade, but I don't believe it's a sensible strategy geopolitically to send all your factories to China necessarily. So if that means I have to compromise for um you know for the to save the working class i need to compromise and, and have a few tariffs i'm willing to pay a little bit more for products and that is mm -hmm. kind of what we look at it we say let's look at the hard world for what it is and we be honest about who we engage with and, and what we um, what we look at and yeah then um the civilization aspect you know plays part of it i think civilizations are real you know Mm. And uh, what I also found very interesting when I was um, I was writing a recent piece on uh, specifically uh, differences between ideological differences between, for example, uh, American conservatives and maybe more classical conservatives, as you really want to call that, call it that. But one of the examples that I always go back to is that debate between uh, Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson on uh, autom uh, automated uh, truck drivers. Uh, ben Shapiro takes very simple. Uh, to put it simply, uh, that he takes the Ben Shapiro takes the stance that yeah, if you're if you can't compete in the market, you should just adapt or die. Uh, Tucker right. Carlson takes the stance of uh, when uh, these types of job killing technologies come in, we have to also sometimes take a a, a more big picture uh, view yeah. on it in regards to is this going to destroy communities? Is this going to uh, pretty much well, the, the, uh, the dirty word here? Jobless. The, the dirty word here is the C word, class. Um, as soon as you start talking about class in the world, um, you are a socialist. You're a Karl Marxist. Now, look, I, I believe class is real. Humans have hierarchies and, and they are elites and they're all like working classes. And whoever makes the decision society has to consider what the social implications of his uh, results are. So good example is Uber. You know, great idea for you and me to take a taxi, every, do not to, to take a taxi for a few cents or a few rands or whatever it is everywhere. Mm. But Taxi driving used to be the job that ordinary people, especially immigrants, used okay, to get into the middle class. It was, uh, it's not a good paying job, but that's where now that's been destroyed. Mm. What is going to happen? Okay, do you have an alternative for that? Well, I'm not sure we always do with automation. The Just learn of, to code. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the learn to code thing is absurd. I mean, are we all, and, and mm. Apple and Google doesn't even pay that well anymore because you have people mm. them just laying the grass. So the argument we have is that we need to bring a lot of these monopolies and, and institutions under democratic rule as well. And I don't think you're a socialist for arguing that, um, you know, especially mm. when it comes to communications technologies. The idea that social media and Twitter and Facebook can censor silent people or um you know, be used for war propaganda, as we're seeing now, without any congressional or parliamentary scrutiny is uh, a little bit wrong. And, and if that makes me a socialist for, say, there needs to be regulation, then I guess I'm a socialist, you know. I, I don't think the free marketeers have always got it right. And again, you know, I believe that capitalism is the way to organize the economy. By and large, it creates the most wealth. I, I am not for central command economy. But the argument is that some of our institutions do exist for a certain purpose. And um, if we believe in functional institutions in the traditional West, they need to be used to try and solve these problems. And the people in the working class, even the labor unions, have a voice to say. And I, I give you an example where it works. In Norway, um, Norway has very high levels of labor unions, um, but they also have the highest paid salary workers in the world. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain the contradiction? And the reason is they learn to cooperate. Um, mm. labor unions don't have to be antagonistic to business. They can work with business and the Norwegians do it remarkably well, but the middle class, the working class are being presented, represented in Norwegian society. And as a consequence, because they are presented, uh, represented, they don't feel alienated from the political process and they have a much more healthier society. Um, mm. so yeah, that's the type of thinking I think we need to look into as well. 
Yeah, uh, and yeah, that's that's such a broad topic that uh, I think a lot of discussion still needs mm. to happen. In it's a little bit of a thorny topic because you are going into uh, going into uncharted not uncharted territory, but you're going into uh, not or uh, not regularly traded uh, territory there. With these yeah, I mean, I, I have in in recent times, and 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 look, Joel, who I write with, is a traditional New Dealer in America. Okay, he's a traditional Democrat socialist. He doesn't use he uses the word patriot and democrat. And he used to be the Liberal Party or the um, Democratic Party, although he's totally distanced himself from them at decent times. Yeah. He's very critical of the woke movement, for example. But you know, these are people in your society, and and I believe you need to make compromise with them. And um, I, I say some social democracy, I think, is probably necessary if we're going to trade well in this world. In particularly, we can use, for example, you know, uh, the liberals have always been open to just free trade everywhere. And I used to be like that until a few years ago. But, you know, pandemic hits, um, there's no supply chains. Okay, mm -hmm. how does that make sense from a geopolitical stance? So, you know, there's a nationalistic argument to make to say we need a few tariffs. Um, mm. And tariffs traditionally, you're a socialist, right? I'm not saying we need tariffs to protect all our inefficient industry, um, and then we just subsidize coal miners, for example. I mean, there's a lot of tariffs in South Africa we can just do away with, just to bring better competition. But we need to be pragmatic about these things, and I think some of these industries must be brought into democratic control if we want the concept of our nation to survive. Because at the end of the day, what does the nation state mean? Does it mean I just get to travel around the world and I'm detached from everywhere and I'm, I'm kind of living that life, but most people aren't. Most people believe in their country and their own technology and their own things. And that, that argument is coming back, I think. Hmm. Now, if we have a question here in the chat that I would actually uh, like you to answer. So uh, Rochelle Tobias uh, says, firstly, and then I think she asks, I'll check now. We are best off paying more or stop traveling so much, becoming more sustainable and using other sources of energy to get away from those countries exploiting their fuel resources at the expense of citizens. So uh, what, I, would you, uh, what would you what would you respond well, to that? Well, first critic is I don't know what sustainability means. I, I really don't. And I, I don't ask that in a sarcastic way. It's just there's so many definitions of it and they just don't make any sense to me. Uh, the first law of economics is scarcity. So, um, you know, there's never going to be enough things. We need to innovate. How do we get rid of those countries? Well, again, you have to outcompete it. There's good news on this. Russia itself is, uh, believe it or not, running out of gas. And nobody believes me when I tell them this. But the Russians, um, their gas fields haven't been modernized since the 1970s. So even though they have a lot of reserves, they don't necessarily have the technology that the Americans have got. So one way is just complete innovation. But look, we, for the time being, we're dependent on Mr. Putin. Uh, whether we like it or not, Vladimir is going to come with his gas tap. And if you try and stop him in Ukraine, he's going to turn it off. So um, the only way to do so is to innovate. Now, the Americans are innovating on natural gas, but then the Democrats came and they blocked, for example, exploration of new gas and new technologies. Mm. And they the, stopped that pipeline as well. Yeah. So that is one thing. The other thing is try and make strategic alliances. The UK, for example, has a lot of gas reserves. They're not allowed to untap it. Now Boris Johnson has changed his tune. He used to be very green, and now he's saying, I'm green and gas. Um, you know, is the gas European, the new green? Grass, well, the European Union has reclassified nuclear and ga natural gas as green. Okay, So mm. everything is green except coal, and the Germans are using more coal. But the point is, um, I'm not against trading with autocratic regimes, because we have to to survive this world, right? It is just when we do so, let's be very careful of what we do. So, you know, if Putin gives us gas, we will have to find accommodation with him. Um, is it possible to find accommodation with the Russians? Well, I think it's more likely than the Chinese at this stage. I still think it's, it's, it's more likely. But we need to realize that Russia is what it is. You cannot wish a democracy onto a country. Although many Russians have democratic attitudes, unfortunately, Russia is this big country that has always had a dictator since the time of Ivan the Terrible. And they tried democracy once and that worked into Lenin. You know, So mm. this is the country you deal with. So if you want to trade with the Russians, all for it. Um, but make sure that you know what your strategy is to when they try and capture another country. Hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for for answering that question. Uh, I think it I think it is an important one. Uh, but I want to get back to something that you mentioned earlier. But then we got onto a very mm. interesting tangent, and that is a uh, so in in online political discourse, it would be the slang term would be woke capital. Now the the real technical yeah. term you actually used, and you called it the S ESG movement, and that stands for environmental, social, and corporate governance. And you mentioned it in your piece as well. 
that's pretty much the technical term for woke capital. Now, if anyone is, before we get into that, so if anyone is interested in that phenomenon, I also did an episode on that with Oren McIntyre and the Prudentialist. If you just type in, um, I think it is, uh, uh, if you just go on my channel and search uh, woke capital or how did we get, yeah, woke capital double point, uh, how did we get here? Uh, you'll get that chat as well. Or if you just search Conscious Caracal or in McIntyre Prudentialist uh, World Capital, you'll find it as well. Um, but anyway, to get into that ESG movement, environmental, social, and corporate governance, what is yes. this and why is the, the Western corporates completely enamored and infatuated with this? Well, it's a religion um, to start with. Um, what it is, I mean, again, as of all these things, there's no actual definition of what ESG is, and there's different definitions, and this, we usually when you see this, you can see what they call greenwashing happening, people presenting a product green when it's actually not, like solar panels and wind farms. But generally what it's saying is, in your entire production line, you need to identify how much CO2 you produce. That's the E side of it, right? And basically you need to try and reduce that or you put a price on it, okay? And then you promise to solve it in the future type of thing. Um, that's the first point of it. So the idea has been if your company has a very good ESG rating, it produces fewer CO2. And if you have less CO2, then basically, technically, we're going to give you a value. So we're going to price the environment, right? So if you do CO2, you release it, I think it's 50 tons a dollar. And that is going to be put into the calculations, and that's going to make you less profitable. It's like a tax you pay. So the idea is if you're an ESG compliant company, like any IT company, because let's face it, you can run that on social panels, so, solar panels, your company's evaluation will be higher and that would attract more capital. And the idea is then good money or friendly money will go in the direction we are nudging the economy towards. Um, that's sort of the, the theory behind it. The social stuff is just woke stuff. It's basically racism 2.0. They put the matrix everywhere and every job is sent to percent is black, white. And it's affirmative action through another lens. Um, the governance, yeah, some of that makes sense, actually. Do you have transparency? Um, do you have good corporate structures? I'm not too opposed to some of this stuff. Um, Anti-criminal uh, things, if you're a big company, um, you know, not accepting bribes. So, yeah, the, 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 the G of ESG is not that bad. It's the E and the S, which is the usually the issue. Um, what it will work out in the end, I'm not sure, because um, I'm seeing a lot of companies becoming green, but I'm not seeing anything change in the product. And I wonder if that's just going to create corruption in the system. And basically, it's going to be a lot of big, lot of money flooded into a hole. And there's been a few investors that's been flagging this and saying, look, we've been promised for the past few years that if we invest into ESG, we can have enormous capital returns and we're not seeing them. Yeah. Um, so the, aren't we just creating another dot-com bubble? It remains to be mm. seen. Yeah, but uh, when it comes to that, uh, you, you're talking about all these investors that have been, uh, as you'd say in Afrikaans, but Omi Bosgelaiis that have been led around the bush. Uh, when it comes to this type of thing, the people at the top, uh, corporates like uh, like BlackRock and all these massive multinational uh, corporations, are they doing it for because they believe this is going to bring them more profits and uh, it's going to actually well, uh, the... produce what they what it promises, or is there something else behind it? You know, what is that Afrikaans, that Sunlam advert, Suntam, I think it was, the South the South the Umbrel, you know, it's the same, oh, yeah, same the, umbrella. The, the umbrella, the, yeah, yeah. The same thing, you know, it's the same stall, but the umbrella keeps on changing. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that is basically what this is in practice. Um, yeah, they, they, they are all saying it, you know, we love the environment for now. Um, I I don't know. I, I Do I really believe that BlackRock with all these massive investments in housing and uh dirty companies are going to become green overnight. I, I don't see any practical way of doing it. What they are after, I think, is state subsidies because the IMF is announcing loans for this. Mm. The governments are loaning loans. So the more greener you look, the more loans you can get. Um, for example, Airbus in France is promising a hydrogen airplane. So the European Union is now into hydrogen. It's the new Fed. And they're promising um, that everything is going to run on hydrogen. Now, I just look at this thing and I say, well, there's a calculation that was done in France 24, which is called, in, everyone should read this article, it's called Hydrogen Aviation's False Promise. And just to power enough, make enough hydrogen for Charles de Gaulle Airport, um, the biggest airport in, in Paris, equivalent to Heathrow mm -hmm. or, or Tambo, you need to use 16 nuclear power stations. That's obviously inefficient. And there's no way to do that, to bring that technology cost down at the moment. So we are throwing money at technologies because they sound cool. They sound green. <laughs> Um, and at the end of the day, when all of these things fail, and it's a remarkable, every single time 
you know, I've been saying it for the past few years now, all renewables lead to natural gas. The guys who love this is, are the guys selling natural gas. The, this is sort of like a PR front for that. Um, you know, but the green stuff goes further. They, there's guys believing you can eat insects soon. There's people believing you can live in smart homes. I am very skeptical of this stuff. I went to a five, six years ago here in Paris, I went to an e ESG exhibition on food and they were telling us in four years, we're all going to be eating insects. Well, I'm still making hamburgers and eating beef. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, don't yeah, know yeah. If, if that prediction yeah, is there. I'm still buying every, uh, every weekend. That's yeah. not changing. I'm not going to put a grasshopper on the uh, on the barbecue on the braai. Well, it, it wasn't even grasshoppers. It was termites, which they fried, you know. And, you know, you can eat a few of them, but uh, <laughs> this is not a supper meal, you know. So yeah. um, I I think a lot of people have predicted the future, and this is a new dot-com bubble. You know, in the 90s, if you put dot-com next to your company, you got money, and investors were falling for it. And it's herd think, group thinking, yeah. And um, we underestimate the amount of propaganda that the bankers are submitted to. Because look at read the New, New York Times. The environment is dying, right? That's what they read. So if you read only that and that's your will, yeah. you will invest your money into this. Where it's going to get a backlash, I think, is as soon as the pension fund starts cashing in. Because it's people's retirement money. And if there's no returns on those products, um, people are going to go back to natural gas. And if I look at the big investors, and I'm not talking BlackRock, BlackRock here, but I look at uh, Warren Buffett. He's still investing into fossil fuels. Okay, And he's usually my go-to investor for what to do with my money. So I, I predict, I mean, we, we pointed this out in our article, even if we hit net zero, which is not going to happen, by the way, um, the world will still get three quarters of its energy from fossil fuels. Like mm. people who wish away fossil fuels have been wrong every single time. And I just say, I, I, I bring the, the truth out, which is uncomfortable. I don't know if anyone in the energy sector, and look, I've worked on wind farms, I've worked on nuclear power plants, I've worked on uh, natural gas, I've worked on all the energy sources. I don't know a single engineer or even uh, one of these financial guys who really believes that the world can hit net zero energy by 2050. Stephen Coonan, who is Obama's energy advisor, he was the he worked at BP, so maybe that's a conflict of interest, but he wrote the book Unsettled about climate science recently and about the entire energy sector. He said it's an impossibility. We are believing in an impossibility here. And then you have to ask yourself, now what about all these investments? And I think we have got this major green bubble sitting and it's waiting to burst and there's mm. going to be a lot of guys injured in the process. Mm. And yeah, you mentioned the, uh, you've, You've touched on it now in, in multiple uh, times in this conversation, but maybe just to make it very clear as we head towards the end, uh, why is net zero a word or a phrase that we're increasingly hearing and it's being championed by political parties from uh, the, the United States to Europe to South Africa? Um, why is net zero a, a mirage? Uh, you use the word illusion. I prefer the word mirage because you're chasing it in the desert. It looks like it's there, but then you get there and it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, we live on a carbon-based planet. Okay, People underappreciate what it means to go net zero. They, they, not even the people. I, I mean, nobody believes this stuff, they say. Um, the energy sector alone produces 20% of all greenhouse gases. I think 7% is from steel and 7% is from uh, concrete. Food produces a hell of a lot of it. And it's even questionable if food produces it because it's a clean loop cycle. But be that as it may, we only have, I think, 13% of the energy sector that is renewable at this stage. In the 1970s, it was 12%. Okay, we've gone 1% in 50 years. Okay, and That's mainly because we stopped running out of dams to build. The, 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 mm. the, the largest dam in the world, the Three Gorges Dam in China, produces 0.01% of, uh, of the world's energy. Okay, 0.01%, effectively zero. The largest solar plant in, uh, I think it's in Morocco, is something like 0.001 or something like that. Gazprom, who is Putin's uh, you know, instrument of doom, produces 12% of the world's energy. Okay, so that is a major factor difference. And somebody needs to give me a practical solution. How are you going to do that in 30 years' time when major infrastructure projects like ITER, this International Thermonuclear Act in South of France, takes 20 years to build? Where Hinkley Point, the nuclear power station, takes, um, I think it's now 10 years going and they still can't get it done. So some guy, um, I think it was on WhatsApp, that did a calculation. And theoretically, we had to have to build one nuclear power station per week Okay, starting last year, to get <laughs> just the energy sector net zero. Mm. It means 90% of your workforce is going to work in energy. It's impossible, mm. an impossibility to begin with. How many nuclear even... engineers is that? 
I don't know. I, I mean, builders, engineers, everyone, you know, women, children, everyone's yeah. going to have to pitch in like the refugees. You have to use them all for nuclear. Okay. That is, it's an insanity to begin with. Then yeah. you have to look at the food, right? Then you have to look at the rare earth minerals, which we haven't even began to solve. There's now companies talking about digging rare earth minerals out of the Pacific Ocean, right? This is impossible. It can't be done. But nobody wants to tell Greta Thunberg, listen, these are the facts. Just we can't do it. So what mm. Stephen Coonan is proposing, and, and I encourage everyone to read his book, it's called Unsettled, The Signs of Climate Change. He proposed if the earth is going to get warm, and I'm, I'm questioning this stuff, but whatever, if you believe it's true, look towards what is called climate adaptation and not mitigation, as opposed to stop burning fossil fuels. Let's continue. And we say, well, the world's going to get warmer by two degrees. It's not a big difference. We can adapt to it. It's much easier just to, you know, save a little bit of money and we try and prevent the hurricane every year. If there's one hurricane, maybe there's two next year. And mm. there's also no indication that hurricanes will increase, for example. So the argument they're asking for is let's go towards a realism of adaptation because the big elephant in the room here is the population of Africa. By the end of this century, I uh, think something like 40% of the world's population, okay, so four out of 10 people will be African. There's no stopping that. They want to enter the middle class. Now, if they cannot enter the middle class in Africa, where are they going to go? Right? Mm. There's a big refugee to the corridor. Middle class there. factories up north. <laughs> exactly. Okay. They're going to Im immigrate. Okay. China already still has a population the size of America that it needs to lift out of poverty. You need fossil fuels to do so. And the Chinese are saying we are going to treat poverty before we treat the climate. The Indians, have, Modi has made at IPCC, the COPE conference, he said India will start looking at this in 2070. And a politician tells you 2070. I mean, they're not serious about this thing. So the only countries who care about wait, this... Wait, just for other... clarification for some people, is that 2070, is he going to start looking at uh, net zero and uh, the climate crisis? In yeah, he's then going to start doing the calculus, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <He's>... <laughs> on, on, the, on the climate catastrophe. Yeah. Okay, so you've got China and India, which is one third of all humanity. Africa soon, which is, you know, going to be one fourth of humanity. Okay, so you add those together, you essentially have something like two out of 10 people in the world potentially who care about it, which is Europe and North America, right? And Cape Town, because UCT is so green and woke, it's <laughs> it's impossible. The rest of the country and the, and the planet does not care about it. We need so, to quarantine Cape Town until we, re uh, until we figure out what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cape Town is sort of the last outpost of the British Empire or something. They, they're just totally different. Um, but whatever it is, you know, the... This is not going to happen. There is no way to decarbonize the economy. Uh, you can try and get rid of people, and I think Klaus Schwab wants to do that, um, but that's not a sensible solution either. The only way is grow the economy and accept that a little bit of warm, which is going to come, one degree, one and a half degrees, maybe two degrees, is not the end of the planet. And you know what? The other thing about this net zero is some countries benefit. Russia loves it because, you know, if the Siberian ice are melting, it's more farmland mm -hmm. for them. And the North Sea Passage opens up for Canada so they can trade with China easily. You don't so there's need advantage. as many uh, nuclear icebreakers anymore. No. And the great advantage is Cape Town will be underwater. I mean, that is mm -hmm. an amazing thing to happen. You know, so there's only benefits to warming up the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, no, the, the thing is absurd. And if you look at the IPCC projections, I don't find anything alarming in it. None of the climate scientists find it alarming. Um, there is an IPCC scenario, which they call RCP 8.5, which assumes we burn more coal than there's reserves in the world, which is never going to happen. And that's where all the alarm comes from. And there's been a few scientists pointing out that, look, that RCP 8.5 is completely ridiculous. And if you take the extreme alarmism out of the predictions, we basically have a soft landing between two and four degrees at the end of the century, uh, which we can easily adapt to, taking into account the minimum and maximum difference in Pretoria is something from minus four to 40. If it's going to be zero to 40, who cares? You know, mm. it's not going to make a big difference. Yeah. So, Ehu, maybe some of the trends that you're seeing, you are living in a country that's uh, still very much uh, going nuclear when it comes to France. Yep. I mean, getting a, how much How much of your percent, a percentation of your percentage, I'm mixing well, my Afrikaans, my English, well, of 90, your energy 90, comes 90, from nuclear? Well, 90 plus percent. You can argue 100 percent because the rest comes from hydro and they pump up hydro using the nuclear. So mm, it's close to 100 yeah. um, percent. Uh, France is definitely not changing course. Well, France produces 0.02% of the world's CO2. So we're there. Mm. 
you know, we we can <laughs> if you don't have to, we can eat bugs basically to <laughs> to get the last mile. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's yeah. nothing France has to do. The UK, by the way, also has to do nothing. That was zero point zero three or four percent. Mm. One reason is the Europeans move their factories to China, and so they mm. offset their CO two. Now, okay, they managed to maintain a, a standard of living doing that, and it's arguable if they should get those factories back or not. But there's nothing we have to do in many countries. Actually, most Western countries, developing countries, don't have to do anything. The country that's reduced most of its fossil fuel usage in the last um, 20 years has been the United States. And that's because they replaced coal with natural gas. Mm. Okay, because gas or gas green, uses green to... gas that uh, everyone's seeing as green gas. energy now. <laughs> it's green energy, you know. So they did more than the Germans did. And the Germans are now burning coal again, you know. So they can't mm. they, they ever think German engineering is very good. So the Western world is there. And the one reason why we are there is because we moved our factories to China and India. Okay. Mm. Now, if we took, take the entire supply chain into account, you find one of the most pollutant countries in the world is Norway, because Norway only exports oil. You know, they don't they don't use it domestically mm, mm, mm. because they've got uh, they've got hydrogen. So you know you can you can run the calculus all you want. I'm just thinking it's an impossibility what they want to do. We live on a carbon based planet, and again, I don't buy the climate change alarmism. I, I think it's totally exaggerated. Um, mm. It should not be the global policy and a fundamental principle that we base our life and our decision and get meaning from. If uh, we can reduce CO2, by all means, let's do it efficiently and cheap. But let's not sacrifice standards of living. That's the argument we make. Mm. And uh, for the sake of environmental piety, that might not even get mm. us anywhere. Because if South Africa falls into the ocean tomorrow with all our coal, we change the, zero, the Earth's temperature by 0. 0.0000 something like 1%. Okay. Mm. We, do we are absolutely insignificant to the temperature of the Earth. The big issue is China and India, and we cannot convince them. So, mm. Yeah, well, Ehu, uh, before we get to the, the final thoughts and before I uh, ask you the final question of tonight, I also just want to uh, say thank you to uh, the sponsor of tonight's episode, uh, that very bad for the environment thing called uh, Bitcoin and crypto, uh, which Bitvice is in the field of. So uh, Bitvice is the only place in South Africa that sells Bitcoin directly to your self-custody, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange, you don't have to trust anyone to hold your Bitcoin for you. This removes the largest risk associated with Bitcoin. And if you are interested in learning about Bitcoin and crypto, check out their podcast called By the Horns. It's available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. I also regularly listen to it just to be kept up to date on what's going on in that sphere. And uh, they realize uh, they release weekly episodes and focus specifically on the South African context surrounding Bitcoin. So um, you can go check out their website. There's a link in the description. If you just have any questions, you can just send them a question and they will definitely get back to you very quickly. So go check out Bitvice. Thank you very much for uh, sponsoring the show. And they're also uh, personal friends of mine. So uh, thank you very much. So let's get to the final question then. And that is, mm -hmm. if you take everything that we've talked about here tonight into you condense it. What is the general trends that you think people need to be focusing on if they want? To, I mean, the world's pretty chaotic. There's a lot of things that people mm -hmm. are struggling to put their finger on because you just have this barrage of information coming out from everywhere. You have to care about Ukraine. You have to care about COVID. You have to care about uh, this, this and that. Where, If you could give people advice, the audience here tonight, where they can focus some of their energy productively in regards to trying to figure out the world around them, what would you tell them? Well, I think the, the basic principle is first change yourself before you want to change the world, right? So if you've got own personal life issues, don't go preach to others what to do. If you're flying around the world with an airplane and a private jet, don't preach to them about carbon emissions. So live the life, I suppose, that you preach to want to preach to others. It's kind of the basic lesson in all of this to me. Um, you know, as for Ukraine and COVID and all these scare stories, I've looked at a lot of them now, running all the way from different pandemics to this one, the carbon, and they all seem exaggerated to me. I think there's a lot of people making money, scaring the living out out of you. Um, and I think most of these fears are unfounded. That includes crime in South Africa, by the way. I, I, it's there, it's not, an, not that it's not an issue, but I think you cannot live in fear all the time. So enjoy your life principally and stop worrying about, you know, other people's realities, I think is the most important things for me. Um, you can, where you use your energy productive in your own life, in your own family, in your own community. And those are the problems you need to solve. And I don't think everyone in the world can be president and try and solve the problems of the world. You know, it's not going to happen. Um, mm. And that's not the way to do it, not to organize society. Mm. 
Well, thank you very much, Ichua. Thank you for joining me here tonight. I thought your your opinion piece was excellent, and that's why that you co-authored. That's why I actually wanted to invite you on to to elaborate on some of those themes. We only touched on some mm. aspects of it. There's still so much to to talk about, and that's why I would encourage people to go read the entire piece called uh, "The New Great Game." There's a link to it in the description for all you lazy guys that don't want to go Google it. There's just a link that you can click. It's very uh, very energy efficient. You don't have to take too much screen time. You just click on it very quickly so Dachbrecher says something that i also want to end on and he says excellent conversation gentlemen it has helped me with my migraine not gonna lie it narrows down a lot of the unnecessary noise well thank you very much that's excellent to hear um but yeah, thank you too. very much yeah you know, thank you very much for for coming on again uh sharing your insights i always really enjoy it and then also thank you very much to uh, the audience that tuned in with all your comments and questions uh, it's always nice so where can people find you well, at the moment, I, I've been quite active on Twitter for the last two weeks on uh, Russia and Ukraine. I'm mm. doing that. I've got a Substack um, account where I write stuff on. I've got a podcast on Odyssey. I haven't done any podcast for last month because thanks to Mr. To Vladimir Putin, we are busy in the oil and gas industry at the moment. So work takes priority, right. unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so I'm on Substack. They can find me there. I've looked into the Ukraine crisis. And again, it's like COVID. It's like climate. There's always two to three sides of any of these stories. And um, I mm -hmm. suppose everyone, just the message I've got for everyone is think for yourself and make up your own mind, you know. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. And then lastly, I just want to say uh, all those links are in the description. So it's... Uh, for your comfort it's just there and if you're new to this channel you can also click like it helps out the show and you can also click subscribe for uh, conversations like this also go check out the content that uh, is creating it's very very interesting and then lastly if you're watching and it's no longer live you can still share your thoughts by uh, commenting in the comment section i read all of them and respond to as many as possible so thank you very much for tuning in guys thank you again Ihu, for your time and uh, i'll see you on the next one uh, when we chat again and Ihu, you'll definitely be back in the future i reckon yeah thank you very much Ernst, and um, yeah like the work you do as well oh thank you very much all right cheers guys have a good one and god